Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam. Okay, so welcome to the class of microwave engineering. Hopefully, everyone can hear me clearly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, it's uh, lecture number three. So in initial two lectures, uh, we haven't covered uh, too much stuff regarding microwave engineering. It was uh, basically the introduction of microwave engineering, the importance of microwave engineering for any electrical engineer. And then also I revise uh, some of the topics that you people have covered in the prerequisite course uh, that is EMF. And I specifically uh, ask you to revise uh, coordinate system uh, and Maxwell equation. Uh, I also uh, make sure that you understood uh, coordinate system concept and Maxwell equations uh, from uh, that particular aspect, uh, which is important for microwave engineering. So today we are going to talk about uh, another important topic that I am not 100% sure that may, but maybe you might have uh, covered that as well in your previous course of EMF, and that is uh, boundary conditions. So let's go through what is uh, boundary conditions and what is their use in microwave engineering. So, in my last face-to-face uh, -face lecture, <clears throat> uh, I wrote down the mathematical form of Maxwell equation. So we have a point form of Maxwell equation as well as the integral form. So if you look at the point form of Maxwell equation, so basically uh, they are differential equations. And from your knowledge of differential equations, you know that whenever you are asked to find the solution of differential equation, so whenever you solve any differential equation, you will always end up with some unknown constants in, there, in the solution. And in order to find the values of those constants, you require some conditions, okay? So from Maxwell equations point of view, Whenever you solve Maxwell equations, you will have some unknown constants in the solution. And in order to find the values of those unknown constant, you require some conditions and those conditions are known as boundary conditions. So that is the mathematical background of why we require boundary conditions, okay? So the point that I am raising is to point a complete and unique solution Maxwell's Differential equations we require boundary conditions. And the other point is <clears throat> where you will require 
uh, boundary condition, what type of problems uh, we will solve that will require boundary conditions. So whenever there is a, a boundary or interface between two different media, so I, I will let me write it down. Whenever Whenever electromagnetic wave travels from one medium to another medium, the change in fields is governed by boundary conditions. So this is the background of boundary conditions. Now, what are the mathematical form of these boundary conditions? We will derive these boundary conditions by making use of Maxwell equations, okay? Because uh, whether we are talking about Maxwell equations or whether we are talking about fields, so we all know that uh, Maxwell equations are fundamental equations uh, <clears throat> that must be satisfied by any field. So in the same manner, when electromagnetic wave consisting of electric field and magnetic field, whenever it moves from one medium to another medium, so the change in the fields, uh, it must be according to Maxwell equations, okay? So let me draw a figure with respect to which uh, I will write down or derive the boundary condition. So just like for Maxwell equations, we have four boundary conditions. So by making use of four Maxwell equations that I devised in my previous lecture, we will end up with four boundary conditions. So let me draw first the figure with respect to which uh, I will be talking about different uh, so let's assume that this is some kind of a boundary <clears throat> and on the bottom side of this uh, line we have medium one and on the other side we have medium two and in my last lecture I mentioned that uh, medium is characterized by some properties. So two of the two important properties are the permittivity. So let's assume that this medium has uh, permittivity epsilon and its permeability is mu one. Similarly, this is medium two. And why I'm calling it medium two? Because this is some kind of a medium which is different than medium one. So it will have its own properties. So let's assume that epsilon two is the permittivity of this medium and mu2 is the permeability of this medium. So this line, as I was talking about, this is the boundary. So on one side of this boundary, we have uh, medium one and on the other side of this boundary, it has medium which is characterized by its own properties. Now, <clears throat> what are the possibilities? Uh, what will be there on this? Uh, again, uh, make sure that you and look at this figure that this line that I have drawn, uh, it's not a line, it's a kind of a plane. You can assume as if this is kind of a plane. So. So there are possibilities that 
we will have charges on this boundary. So let me I'll represent that on this boundary, there is a possibility that there are charges. So these uh, dots are representing uh, charges. So we know that charges are represented by symbol rho. And because these are on the surface, so I will call it rho s. Okay. Rho s. What is rho s? Rho is the symbol for electric charge, let me, electric surface charge. So electric surface charge density. So how many charges per unit area are there on this surface? They are represented by rho s. Now there is a possibility that these charges, uh, some of charges may be in motion. So it means we will have charges in motion, which, we, which means that we will have a current as well. So let me represent uh, the current by this uh, arrow. And the symbol that I will use for current is JS. JS. And what is JS? As we have mentioned before, J is a symbol for electric current density and because I am writing as JS, so it means this is surface charge density. Surface current density, sorry. Surface current density. So uh, current per unit area is represented by this. And just to complete uh, the discussion, we also mentioned that uh, theoretically there is a possibility that we will have uh, magnetic current density as well. So I can represent the magnetic current density by this double arrow. So this is the symbol for MS. You already remember that I use this symbol in Maxwell equation as well. So this M is the symbol for magnetic current density. So this is magnetic current density, which is not a physically realizable quantity. Okay, it is just a mathematical quantity. So what I have done is, <clears throat> I have considered a general situation that at the boundary between two media, there is a possibility that we will have charges, we will have electric current, and we can have magnetic current. Now with this, uh, what are the four quantities that I want to relate uh, using a boundary condition. So one of the quantity that I will uh, find the relationship is that on this side of the boundary, there can be a electric flux density. <clears throat> electric flux density, if you remember the symbol that we use for electric flux density is D. And if you look at the uh, direction of this arrow, it is taken as normal to the boundary, okay? So the arrow is bound normal. So it means this arrow is representing the normal component. So I will represent it as D with a subscript N to uh, denote that this is the normal component of the electric flux density in medium one. And because it is in medium one, so we will represent, we will represent it by D N one. Now, I want to find out what is going to be the normal component of electric flux density on the other side of the boundary. So I'm interested in finding out D and two. So the boundary conditions will tell us what is the relationship of D and one with D and two. In a similar manner, we will find out what is the relationship of the normal component of magnetic flux density. So again, I'm going to draw it in such a manner that it is normal. So this is now magnetic flux density and it's normal component. And because it is in medium one uh, area, so I will call it BN1. 
and I will going to find out what is going to be its relationship with B and two. So whether D and one will be equal to D and two, or whether they will have some other relationship, uh, we will find it out in a short while. Similarly, I will be able to find out the relationship of B and one and B and two. So these are the normal components. Okay, so. What are the other two boundary conditions? So let me also denote the normal direction by this unit vector n. So this uh, n uh, with a hat is representing the direction that is normal to this boundary. Okay. So what are the other two components uh, that we will find out? That is. I'm also interested in finding out what is the relationship of the tangent component. So let's assume that this is the arrow and you can clearly see that the arrow that I've drawn is now in such a way that it is parallel to this boundary or tangent to the boundary. And this arrow is going to represent the electric field E and with tangent component. So we will denote it by E with a subscript T and then again, this is in medium one side, so we will call it ET1. So what is ET1? ET1 is representing the tangent component of the electric field, which is uh, in medium one side. And we are going to find out its relationship with another tangent component that is ET. And because now we are in medium two, so we are going to recall it ET2. So what is ET1? Tangent component of electric field. And uh, what is ET2? It is also tangent component, but ET1 is on uh, at the bottom of this boundary and ET2 is at the top of the boundary. Okay. And similarly, we will be going to find out the relationship of tangent component of magnetic field ET1 with, sorry, HT1 with HT2. So as I mentioned, there are four boundary conditions. So now you know that what are those four boundary conditions? One boundary condition uh, will relate uh, D1, Dn1 to Dn2. Second boundary condition will relate Bn1 to Bn2. Third boundary condition will relate Et1 to Et2. And fourth boundary condition will tell us the relationship between Ht1 and Ht2. So let's start with the first boundary condition, and that is, what is the relationship of uh, Dn1 with Dn2? Okay, so for that, uh, I will move to the other uh, figure. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to draw the same boundary, but now focusing only on Dn1 and Dn2. So what we have is, this is the boundary, this is, Medium one, medium two. So in order to uh, find the relationship, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the first uh, Maxwell equation. So what is the first Maxwell equation? That is the Gauss's law for electric flux density. That is electric flux passing through any closed surface must be equal to the charge enclosed by that closed surface. So this is the Maxwell equation, which we revised in our previous class. Because uh, I want to relate uh, Dn1 and Dn2, and because electric flux density is, uh, it has to follow this uh, Maxwell equation, so I have to use this. So in order to use uh, this equation, uh, on Dn1 and Dn2, you see that I need to have a closed surface. 
because this Maxwell equation is telling us that electric flux passing through a flow surface. So what I can do is I can visualize that there is a closed surface having shape of a cylinder such that half portion of that cylinder is in medium two and half portion is in medium one. You can see that I am drawing a, a cylinder, which is a closed surface in such a manner that half portion of the cylinder is in medium one and half portion is in medium two. So now, this is the height of the cylinder. Let me call it H. This is the height of the cylinder. This is representing the surface area. So let's let's call it delta S. So now if you go back, this is the direction of uh, DN1 and DN2. So with respect to this cylinder, what we are going to find out is how much flux is entering this surface, this closed surface, and then how much flux is coming out. So I am considering this case number one, and you can clearly see this is DN1, and this is DN2. So with respect to the closed surface, uh, I have represented this DN1 and DN2. Now, because uh, this is our boundary, I am interested in the behavior of DN1 and DN2 at the boundary. Okay. So, what I, I can do is I can transform this cylinder in such a manner that it is projected on the boundary. So it can only project on the boundary if I assume that this height of the cylinder is almost equal to zero. So what I'm going to do is, let me write it down that I am applying, I'm going to use this equation uh, to particular to this particular case, but what I'm going to do is, I am going to apply the limit. And my limit is, that the height of cylinder is so small that it is almost equal to zero. So now, <clears throat> can you visualize this thing that when you make this uh, h equal to zero, so what will happen? What will happen is that this cylinder, it will be just like this. We will have only this area. It is this is DN one, and this is DN two. So, when you make H equal to zero, it means that cylindrical surface, the site area, it becomes equal to zero. So, only area that is going to be included in the flux is this one, which is having an area of delta S. So now, what will happen to this integral? How much flux is uh, passing through this, coming out of this? So this flux, dn2, you can see this uh, is pointing outward, and this dn1 is pointing inward. So how much is the net flux coming out? It must be the flux which is coming out minus the flux which is going out. So going in, so I will say, this equation will become d n two delta s minus d n one delta s. So the left hand side will become like this. 
and it must be equal to the right hand side and what is right hand side the charge enclosed by this surface so how much is the charge enclosed by this surface so how much is the charge density rho s these are the number of charges per unit area and the area that we are considering is this much so how much charge will be enclosed in this portion they must be equal to rho s delta s so this delta s delta s cancel out so we end up with d n2 minus d n1 equal to rho of s so what this equation is telling us actually this is the first boundary condition and what this boundary condition is telling us that the difference between the normal component of electric flux density at any boundary must be equal to how much is the surface charges at the boundary so d n2 minus d n1 will be equal to rho s now it means that for how much is the difference between d n1 and d d n2 it is dependent on rho s so if we have a situation where there are no charges where there are no charges on the boundary we have a situation that we have two different medias but at the boundary we don't have any charges then according to this equation the right hand side will be zero which means that dn2 must be equal to dn1 so it means there will be no difference in the normal component of electric flux density at such boundary okay now this is uh, our equation or desired first boundary condition but it's always better to write this equation in a vector form so as i've already mentioned that dn why i'm calling it dn because this is the normal component so actually we have uh, let me go back on this side we have vector d1 and on this side we have vector d2 now this vector can be in any it can be pointing in any direction but it may have one component that is normal and that is why i've represented this by dn1 what is dn1 dn1 is the normal component of d what is dn2 dn2 is the normal component of d2 now we have already represented uh, we, we have already uh, drawn this vector n this vector is the unit normal vector what is this n this is representing unit normal vector normal to what normal to boundary so if d1 is given to me and i am asked to find out what is the normal component so i can take the dot product of this and it will give us the normal component so what i am going to do is i can write this this thing in this manner that is unit vector n dot product with d2 minus unit vector n dot product with d1 must be equal to rho x and this is our first boundary condition this is your first boundary condition it's also important that you can interpret this equation <clears throat> as i mentioned in my introductory lecture that i don't want you to be able to derive boundary condition or any other equation that we will be covering in this course my concern is that you should have a conceptual knowledge or understanding of that equation so this first boundary condition is telling us that the difference between the normal component of electric flux density at any boundary will be equal to the surface charge density or you can also uh, interpret this equation as you can say that the normal component of electric flux density will be discontinuous 
the normal component of electric flux density at the boundary will generally be discontinuous and discontinuous means that it is equal to something and this rho s is generally a non zero number okay uh, let me uh, say in a different manner that if you have a situation like this that n d2 minus n d1 is equal to zero why it is zero because there is a possibility that in some cases the, at the boundary at the boundary we don't have any surface charges so then we will have this situation so how you will describe this equation we will say that normal component of electric flux density is continuous because it is equal to zero it means it is continuous because it means that there is no difference between n dot d2 and n dot d so it means they are continuous so as uh, electromagnetic wave move from medium 1 to medium 2 the normal component of electric flux density as it passes through this boundary it doesn't change because it is equal to zero but in this case in a general case you can see it is not equal to zero it is equal to rho s and rho s is generally not equal to zero so you will say that normal component of electric flux density may change and may change means that it is discontinuous in a similar manner <clears throat> now we are going to derive the second boundary condition and now we are going to find the relationship between normal component of b1 and normal component of b2. so again i am going to apply a maxwell equation and now which maxwell equation we can use uh, the equation that uh, relates to the magnetic flux density so as per maxwell equation the total magnetic flux passing through any closed surface is always equal to zero and this is basically gauss's law for magnetic field or magnetic flux which we have already discussed so now again uh, in order to apply this equation uh, i have to consider a closed surface so the appropriate closed surface can be again the same cylinder such that half portion of that cylinder is in medium one side and half portion is in medium two side. So this is, let's say height of the cylinder and this is again the area. Now because uh, my concern or my goal is to find out uh, the behavior of B1 and Bn2 at this region. So I can apply again i can use the limit that the cylinder that i'm considering is such that its height is very very small so that it is almost placed at the boundary so you can say that uh, there was a cylinder like this when you reduce its height it becomes like this you further reduce it it like looks like it so in the limit almost when height is zero it will be just like this so what i'm going to do in the same manner, I will say in the limit h approaches to zero. So, what will happen to the this integral? How much flux is passing through this? So, this is b n two. This is b n one, and this is delta s. So, you will say b n2 delta s minus b n1 delta s equal to zero delta s can be taken as common and then it can be the shifted to the right side so it will become zero so again we end up with b n2 minus b n1 is equal to zero and again, I can write this equation in a vector form. So I will say unit vector n and 
its dot product with B2. So unit vector n dot product with B2 is going to give you the normal component, which is this one. Similarly, unit vector n dot product with B1, and this thing is equal to zero. Now this equation is our second boundary condition. So what is the meaning of this equation? This boundary condition is telling us that the normal component of magnetic flux density will always be continuous. The normal component of magnetic flux density is always continuous. So as wave move from one medium to another medium, the normal component of magnetic flux density will not change. Bn2 is equal to Bn1. Okay. So, uh, so far what you have seen is, uh, it's uh, again the meeting uh, time is almost finished. It's uh, less than one minute remaining. So we will continue with this lecture in the next session. But what we have done so far is we have derived two boundary conditions by making use of two Maxwell equations, okay? So let's move on to the next session.